Welcome to the inaugural, the maiden voyage, the flagship episode of the appropriately named uh, Cleveland State University Psychology Club podcast. I'm Kevin Jaworski. I am one of your hosts. I am a uh, student, grad student in the clinical psychology master's program here at Cleveland State, and I am joined by my co-host. I'm Madhwa Gulgali. I am also a grad student at Cleveland State. I'm in the experimental research program, and I'm one of the co-hosts for the Psychology Club podcast. Yeah, and in this uh, first episode, we talked to Dr. Connor McLennan. He is the chair of Cleveland State University's Department of Psychology, as well as a professor. Uh, he is the director of the Language Research Laboratory here, um, and he got his PhD in cognitive psychology at the University of Buffalo. And yeah, we talked about a lot of interesting stuff on this episode. So what was the most interesting thing about, uh, thing about this particular podcast for you, Kevin? Yeah, there was a lot there. We covered a lot of ground. I mean, instantly what jumps to mind was, you know, talking about how, you know, those brain training games and whether or not they actually pr improve, um, you know, cognitive performance and if that's generalizable to other tasks uh, yes. other than just the games themselves. Yeah, that's uh, that was interesting. As somebody who speaks multiple languages, I think the bilingual controversy was something that... Uh, uh, caught my eye. I was per personally very interested in knowing uh, that if bilinguals have like a cognitive advantage over people who speak uh, one language. Um, it was really um, eye-opening to listen to uh, some of the research. I think uh, uh, Dr. McLean does himself does uh, research on bilingualism and to hear from him about uh, these topics was um, really great. Yeah, um... Yeah, it was good stuff. So I guess with, uh, don't want to spoil too much. So with nothing further from us, here is uh, Dr. Connor McLennan. Great. Thank you for having me. So Dr. McLennan, one thing I have to ask, why Spanish? Why Spanish? Yeah. Oh, great question. I just became interested in that in, in middle school and then high school. I took some trips to Mexico, uh, then decided to major in Spanish in college. I spent a semester abroad at the University of Seville hmm. uh, or La Universidad de Sevilla and I just love Spanish. So how uh, with Spanish obviously you are interested in psychology so how did you become interested in psychology? So I actually took Psych 101 just to fill out some credits and uh, it was in my junior year as an undergrad and that's when I learned that there was more to psychology than just clinical psychology, mm -hmm. uh, and that one area of psychology was cognitive psychology, and some cognitive psychologists are interested in language. So that's when I realized that as much as I love Spanish, I was also more interested in language more broadly and how people learn languages, how people process languages, differences between written and spoken and sign languages. So how, how do people come to learn language? Uh, good question. So, um, you know, I think learning language and acquiring languages are two different things. Mm. So it's a subtle distinction, but an important distinction. So adults learn a language, right? So you already know a language, and then you try to learn a second or third language. Uh, infants are acquiring language, so they're acquiring in a natural setting. They're acquiring by demand in order to communicate with their fellow human beings. So I think th to keep in mind the distinction between language acquisition and language learning. Okay. Uh, so if I'm getting this right, dude, it feels like uh, for newborns, language is more like an instinct. Do you think that is true? Um, so it's a loaded question here, right? <laughs> the language instinct. Uh, well, I think there's some basis for that claim here, right? That there's yeah. a, a nature that um, all infants would acquire some language skills and that yeah. there's um, social and external pressure to do so. Wow. How would you exp explain your research to, uh, um, like, the lay audience? So I think there are three different areas of my research and uh, the way that I've been thinking about my research program. So one area, the area in which I had the most training and my dissertation and follow-up research since, uh, is on trying to understand how listeners process language across different circumstances, so across different talkers, for example. So how do you know that it's the word computer when I say the word computer and your little sister says the word computer? If you look at these on a 
waveform, they might look quite different. The pitch is different. Uh, the differences would be easy to point to, but we uh, almost instantly recognize these as the same word. So one area of my research program is trying to understand how it is that listeners can access words so efficiently across different sources of variability. Do you find that, um, that there are differences in, or have you looked at, as far as like the social context of hearing a word, even maybe same word from the same person, but in different contexts? Um, so that's a good question. So we are looking at recognizing the same word from the same person. One of the contexts that we do is in an experimental context, so in a lexical decision task. If you have uh, listeners hear real words and then nonsense words, and in each trial they just have to press a button saying this is a real word or this is a non-word, changing the non-words that are in the experiment can change listeners' ability to recognize the real words in the experiment. So, for example, if the non-words sound more like real words, and this is a more difficult, more challenging task then to distinguish between real words and non-words that sound like real words, then listeners slow down to recognize the real words, and that has consequences then for their ability to cope with variability. So in that case, if they're slowing down, then they slow down even further if you change the talker where if the non-words are more obviously non-words, making the task easy to distinguish real words from non-words, um, then listeners are faster to recognize the spoken words, and there it doesn't seem to matter if the same word is repeated by the same talker or if we change talkers on them. So uh, some of our uh, audiences might not be familiar with this term, lexical decision task. What what is lexical decision task? Yep. So lexical decision. So lexical is whether something's a word, right? Okay. So our mental lexicon is our mental dictionary of words that we know. Mm. Uh, so a lexical decision task is asking listeners to decide whether what they're hearing is a real word or not, or mm. a non-word. Um, so that's the lexical decision task. I'm talking about it in the context of spoken word recognition, but you can, of course, do a visual lexical decision task as well. Right. So uh, as as somebody who has been studying this for uh, now more than a decade, I assume, uh, what is what what aspect of this part of study you find very fascinating that keeps you wanting to do more research personally speaking as a researcher okay what? question so i think that there are some things that we can measure uh, as researchers that are reliable over time that would be outside of our intuition right so a lot of what we're looking at are what might seem to be small effects, right, and the order of milli millisecond differences between various conditions. Now, these differences have important theoretical consequences for how we think listeners are representing and processing language, but I don't think any of us would think, oh, in this condition, I'll be 50 milliseconds faster than in this condition, right? We probably couldn't do that if we tried. Mm. So these subtle but important, at least theoretically important distinctions. Um, so that's one thing that I think is interesting. Some of these effects are reliable over time. Mm. So priming, the fact that you might be faster to respond to a word that you heard recently. Uh, I don't know that we would feel that we would be faster just because we heard the word house you know a couple minutes ago we mm. might not feel that we'd be faster to respond to that word house but now over time over many different researchers and labs and settings we know that that's the case so you mentioned priming which is uh, interesting to me and how our uh, responses are faster if we have heard that word before do you think um, uh, this sort of thing plays out in the real world or do you think it's completely a laboratory phenomenon Okay, so first I want to take issue with the use of the real world, right? Okay. So, uh, as I think many researchers do. Okay. So, when I'm talking about conducting studies in my lab, participants show up, put on headphones, that's the real world, right? Okay. This isn't a computer simulation or a virtual environment, that's the real world. That Nevertheless, sense. I understand <laughs> the question. You mean an everyday context outside yeah. a lab setting, right? An yeah. everyday context, right? Um, and I think the answer to there is that it could, right? Mm. So, in many of these instances, I pointing out that it's theoretically important. Mm. That, that usually what we're interested in is the conditions under which we would find an effect or not mm. because it has important theoretical consequences. In everyday life it might be more more of a stretch and or or less frequent to have an impact but it could have a difference so one example that we think about with spoken language for example 
how often does a 60 millisecond difference matter, right? Mm. Probably on a daily basis, rarely if ever, but it could, right? Yeah. If you're a pilot receiving an important signal or yes. if you're a medical doctor performing a surgery and, you know, milliseconds matter, yep. then understanding how people recognize language even in the resolution of a matter, matter of milliseconds could have important implications. So we're talking about lexical decision making and one um, domain in which this has kind of found its way into the popular culture is in brain training games where you'll see, you know, like you'll be flashed like the word red and it will be colored red and then you'll be flashed the word green but it'll be colored red and then you have to respond to uh, the word rather than the color and then the idea being that like the quicker you are at this the smarter it makes you and this like applies to your you know everyday life in some way what's your take on all of this okay so you're just describing the stroop task right yeah so a classic yeah. experimental task in experimental psychology so we've used the stroop task in my lab for research questions but your question about brain training whether it's the stroop task or others i think what the overwhelming evidence points to currently is that if you train on these particular tasks you'll get better on these particular tasks but they don't generalize so a claim along the lines of what you just mentioned that it would make you smarter um, goes far outside of what the evidence suggests at this point point. Um, and in fact there are far better ways imported supported by the science uh, for improving your cognitive capacities so so one that you may not think of is aerobic exercise. So exercise will do your brain far better than practicing the Stroop task over and over. Oh. So you mean if I keep practicing the Stroop task, I get better only at Stroop task? That is what the majority of the evidence seems to point to, that they're limited. So if if it weren't limited, if it weren't so specific, then it would generalize, right? And generalizing is really the gold standard. Um, Maybe somebody wants to train on a particular task to get better at that particular task, but more often what we're trying to do is generalize so that we get smarter, or we get better cognitive abilities. And the weight of the evidence, including some rather scathing uh, reviews and recent meta-analyses of the literature, suggests that that's just not the case or that any generalization is much more limited than, than some of these more sweeping claims suggest. So all the time that I spent my teenage years playing video games, I just got better at video games? <laughs> the short answer is yes. Uh, there may be other skills, though. So video games is an interesting one because if you were practicing a specific task over and over, like the Stroop task, then I'd be faster to answer to yes to that question. You'd be better at that one thing you were practicing. Now, if you spend a lot of time video games, there's actually another area of research at looking at the relationship between video game players and novices on things like attentional capacity. Okay. And there, there may be real differences. Um, but it's less likely that you focused all your attention on one very specific skill in that case. Instead, you were probably gaining a variety of different types of training that that might be more likely to think that there'd be some generalization or some benefit. Well, my mom will be disappointed to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> well, video games is, again, there is some evidence that that might uh, lead to at least differences in, say, um, the way that um, video game players attend to information compared to novices. You're in graduate school, Madhu. I think your mom is very <laughs> proud of you. Yeah. So uh, I grew up with... Uh, learning different languages so I have a mother tongue but uh, the language that I spoke outside um, was a different language so my mother tongue is Kannada and the language that I spoke outside my house was uh, either Hindi Marathi or English and I when I was a kid I learned learned languages like these four languages I picked them up there was another language that I pick, picked up but I did not use it anymore so I've, I've forgotten how to use it so uh, there is some research. Uh, there, at least there, there is a claim which says that uh, if you know more languages, you're likely to be more smarter. Do, do you think that is the case? And so, uh, uh, this, this is what has been, I think, called the bilingual controversy within the academia or something like that. So, yep, uh, good question. This is a, a timely question. So it's currently, you know, a debate in the in the field. So you're referring to the bilingual advantage, what's been termed the bilingual advantage. Yep. The idea that uh, bilinguals have an advantage in cognitive processing, cognitive processes uh, relative to monolinguals. 
and there have been related claims to that, that actually being bilingual has a protective mechanism on the brain so that bilinguals are either less likely to get uh, Alzheimer's and other types of dementia than monolinguals, or they do so at a later age. Hmm. Um, and this is really a, a good question of what I think happens often in science, uh, both psychological science and other areas of science, is that the pendulum swings back and forth. So if you actually go back um, further, the original idea was that being bilingual was bad for your brain. Oh. And in fact, there was an extreme claim by an educational researcher that bilingualism was actually a cause of mental retardation. Oh. Then you fast forward to more recently where it's the other end of the spectrum where there's the claim of a bilingual advantage that if you know more than one language um, it actually has protective mechanisms for your brain it leads to better cognitive processing relative to monolinguals and now the pendulum is starting to swing back a little not to the fact that it's bad for you or bad for your brain but maybe that the uh, claims of a protective mechanism for your brain and or an advantage were either premature or exaggerated so you know this is an ongoing debate right now where there are very much big name researchers in the field that support the idea that there is a bilingual advantage uh, and there are others who are calling this into question including a recent uh, meta-analysis that suggests that the bilingual advantage is much weaker than has been claimed in the literature so my take on it is that it's um, reasonable to think that the underlying mechanisms for which there would have been a bilingual advantage in the first place that it's reasonable to think that this could lead to an advantage in some context. Okay. More uh, more specifically though, I think that what we could expect is that there would be differences in some some areas of processing between bino, bilinguals and my, monolinguals and that sometimes those differences might actually lead to worse performance, sometimes those differences would lead to better performance. So I think it's going to be more nuanced than just looking for are bilinguals better in all of these areas relative to monolinguals and instead it'll be in which conditions is there any difference at all and in those conditions in which ways are bilinguals different than monolinguals sometimes I, I suspect that that'll be better performance and other times it may be worse performance. Um, something that comes to mind is the um, differences between bilinguals who um, learned a second language uh, or learned two languages like early in life versus like somebody who learned a second language as an adult or a teenager. Yep, I'm glad you brought that up. So this, everything we just said, including what I've been saying, is acting as if bilinguals are a thing, right? That, that you can either be bilingual or monolingual. But of course, we think that this is more along a continuum of bilingualism, and it depends on a number of factors. So it depends on the age of acquisition, the proficiency in the languages, your frequency of use of the languages at any one time, how similar or not the languages are that you're speaking. So I think all of these things will matter and will relate to the question of whether or not you can expect differences in performance on other types of cognitive tasks between particular types of bilinguals and monolinguals. So nowadays we're frequently um, interacting with technology in, in that we're actually using our voice to talk to Alexa or Siri. Um, do you see any ways in which uh, technology could compare to a human in their ability to perceive speech? Well, I think that the technology has improved dramatically in the last 20 years, right? So it used to be the case that you would get automated machines, automated speech recognition, and it would be painfully obvious how terrible they are. So you would call and try to book your flight online or something, and it would take 10 attempts to, to get this done. Now I think they're much better than they were. Um, and because they're much better than they were, I think that in itself is a major accomplishment of research in the area of speech communication, um, both cognitive scientists and engineers, linguists, and others that have contributed to that progress. I think that there's still, though, uh, a long way to go. So some recent examples of challenges from Alexa, as you've brought up, and other uh, automated speech recognition devices has been anything outside the training environment. The training environment, at least traditionally, has been limited to monolingual English-speaking adults. So anytime you're outside of that area, the, the device can run into a challenge. So anyone speaking with a foreign accent might have a challenge, mm. and children. So children speaking often have more challenges. Um, well, the device has more challenges recognizing language um, by children than adults would. So, uh, so 
you are impressed by the amount of uh, the way in which um, the devices the artificial intelligence de- intelligent devices can perceive speech and uh, if you had to s- compare it to a human h- how impressed would you be as compared to a human well so i am impressed with the progress that has been made right yeah. so i am impressed i think that there's a long way to go and i think humans are much more impressive in that capacity right so we're able to recognize speech extremely quickly and accurately and in fact the situations in which the our ability to recognize language breaks down stand out to us as frustrating right Mm -hmm. but someone has to have a really strong foreign accent or we have to have a really crappy cell phone signal or there has to be some case in which we break down at all otherwise we can keep up in in what at least feels like real time almost all the time Mm -hmm. so i still don't think that's the case for these automatic speech recognition devices, and again, especially if you get outside monolingual English speaker adults, right, so children, anyone with a foreign accent, then humans compared to these machines stand out as even being more impressive in our ability to cope with that variability. So machines are not going to take over anytime soon? <laughs> not, not anytime soon. Huh? Okay. That's that's nice. Too. We have some time. Yeah. I, I think the areas probably of research focus in, in the coming years um, for automatic speech recognition devices will be now that there's been sort of an impressive rate of uh, progress in recognizing the words themselves, there will be increased focus on sort of what's been referred to as paralinguistic or a- extra linguistic information. So picking up the tone of voice, being able to recognize whether the speaker is sad or depressed mm. or whether the speaker is joking, right, and using sarcasm. Um, so these extra linguistic features I think will be a focus of these recognition devices moving forward. Yeah, I mean I had read this book called How the Mind Works um, by Steven Pinker. Um, in that book and that book was published I think it was in 1999 or something. It's way beyond. In that book he mentioned that there were uh, computer devices that could act as counselors and um, I was like that's amazing but do do you think uh, like do we have anything similar to that or like they can talk as counselors but they cannot act as counselors so maybe act is a too strong a word maybe he did not use it um, maybe i'm not uh, characterizing that fairly but there were he, there was a claim that those those could do the function that counselors do do you think they they are as similar um to humans that's what my interest is right uh, i think can the they mimic uh, the human's capacity for emotions and stuff like that. The fact that there would be any type of parallel, I think, is fascinating and interesting, right? But uh, I I think that that is still not the case, and I really <laughs> suspect that that was not the case in 1999, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that there will be more differences than there will be similarities at this point, right? And in order to be able to do that, they would have to get much better at the types of things I was just saying, right? Do more than just recognize the words that are being said, but understand the value of context, understand the value of intonation differences, uh, and so on. Yeah, it's kind of easy to envision possibly in the not so distant future, maybe on the drive home from work, you're talking to, you know, whatever the name of the AI in your car is, talking about how you had a stressful day and then they're interacting with you and then yeah. we're measuring, okay, do you feel better after that? Like, how does your mood change doing that versus, let's say, like talking to a, another person on your drive home or right. something so like that? The, the fact that that might be possible at all is, is interesting and the potential yeah. for that is, is it's obvious to get excited about but again I think currently uh, the value of a human in that <laughs> context would be would far outweigh what you would get from an automatic device but that doesn't mean that, that there isn't some value for considering how that could be incorporated as well so uh, as cognitive, as a cognitive psychologist and as someone who actively engages in research uh, I'm f- I'm interested to ask your opinion about AI in general. I mean, there are people who are happy about it. There are people who are like, this is the end of the world and things are like going to, uh, I know the things are creeping slowly towards machines and stuff like that. So what do you think, where do you stand on that, like in general? So I think that there are cases where the 
AI technology could dramatically improve our lives, both just conveniences of life and everyday life. So, you know, I have an Alexa at home and I'm fascinated <laughs> by its uh, ability sometimes and I think it's great. Um, but the claims that they're so far along that we have to worry about them taking over the world or something, I think, are, are um, you know, not lining up with the current state of affairs and the research and the science. Again, there's impressive progress. It's interesting. They mm. can be in value in many different contexts, not only for, you know, luxury or conveniences, but in scenarios that could be life-saving or critical in other ways. Yeah. So I think that we could and should be investing in AI technology for, for all of those reasons, but I, I think the fears are um, over overblown. But I think also, I, I read recently some claims that the fact that we're making these machines human-like, giving them human-like voices, mm -hmm. um, if you actually think of robots that would have human-like characteristics and faces, um, contributes to our our comparison to them as humans, right? Yeah. And then both both expectations and fears can become overblown because we're making this comparison as if these devices were humans. So I have to admit though that all the the Boston I think it's Boston Dynamics. Yes, that comes to mind. Yeah, those like uh they've kinda have these like dogs that like run around and like <laughs> the guy carrying the box and you see the guy like knocking him over with the broomstick and then I feel kind of, I'm like, he's being so mean to that robot. And I'm like, what's that robot going to do in retaliation? And then, right, exactly. You're yeah. making them, yeah. up their appearance lifelike. I'm, imbu remember. I'm imbuing them with human qualities. Exactly. Yeah. It will remember, and 40 years later, it's going to come and take its revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one another fascinating thing with the language thing is, why is it hard to learn a language when you become older? as compared to when you're younger. Yep, so I hinted at this before, right, yeah. with the difference between language Equal. learning and language acquisition, right? Yeah. Um, so if you think about uh, this is why this would be, there's a number of reasons why this could be. One, I think, is fairly obvious. If you're an infant acquiring language, then if you want to be able to communicate with your fellow human beings, especially as an infant, if you want to get food, if you want to get changed, if you want to you know, have your basic needs taken care of, then there's real demand on you to keep up and acquire this language, right? So that's one of them. Um, the other, though, is that in language learning, as an adult later in life trying to learn a language, you already know a language. So you're comparing this language to be learned with what you already know. Mm. So that's why if you're trying to learn two languages that are similar to one another, in some ways that can be very helpful mm. because sometimes words sound alike, sometimes grammatical structures are similar, so it could be helpful for your rate of, of progress, rate of learning. On the other hand, those similarities can also interfere with your ability to, to process those languages because you're also so making the comparison to the language you're learning with the oh. language you already know. Oh. So in that in that way, actually, languages that are more different can um, at least have some aspects that are easier to learn because there's this uh, tendency to, to compare the two languages are, you know, uh, stronger if the two languages are similar than if they're more different. It's because when I was young, I learned like four or five languages. But in my, like when I was 20, I tried to learn German. It was almost impossible for me to learn German. It's, it's like couldn't understand it as you used to and I had a teacher whom who used to tell me that if you if I go to a German class she used to say if you want to ask doubts or questions ask in German she wouldn't allow me to ask questions or doubts in any other language I was like how do you say water in German she she wouldn't answer although she knew that uh, what how do you say water in German she would like try to ask in German I was like yeah. I, I didn't see any point in doing that, but I, what did I know? I was just 20 year old. So, so, so part of this, you know, again, is the frequency. So you, you said it was very difficult, almost impossible to learn German. But think about how much of your waking life were you actually devoting to that activity? Even if you went to all of your classes and you, you did well, you studied maybe a couple hours outside of classes, that still would mean most of your waking life was not spent on German, right? yeah. or probably even thinking about it or, or making any attempt to learn it. Now compare that again back to the infant who is spending all of their waking time trying yeah. to figure out what's going on, including language. Um, so a way to 
to come closer to simulating that effect as an infant is that's why uh, exchange programs or foreign language um, exchange programs are going to another country can be so effective because mm -hmm. you're coming closer to that environment especially if you go alone you go to an area where no one speaks your language or languages yeah. uh, then you're closer to that situation where you now are thinking about this for much more of your waking life right trying to figure out what's going on so that you can communicate I should have gone to Germany <laughs> to learn German. Right. All else being equal, that's why those uh, <laughs> techniques are more effective. Okay. So, do you, do you have any more questions? Uh, do you want to yeah. talk about the limitations of the language? Sure. Stuff? Yeah. The 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 big one. Um, yeah. So. Do uh, yeah. So um, you know, there's kind of this idea, I think, in in philosophy, and you run into it, and in, you know, in spirituality, and just really like trying to figure out or this idea that language just is not sufficient mm -hmm. to get at certain things like it just it can't seem to be done um you know in a philosophy ancient philosophy class maybe we're talking about um you know the nature of reality and how that might relate to to god or what we would call god and that and very frequently you would hear you know the philosophers or like the wise sages you know saying things like well you just this needs to be experienced you just can't talk about it there's no language for it um so yeah there's this idea that um yeah that language just isn't adequate to it just it can't get at certain things. So, the part of this question for me, particularly, arises from like this guy called Ludwig Wittgenstein. So I kind of uh, was fascinated by his work in uh, language and logic and stuff like that. Although I couldn't understand most of it, I had to read it. But then I had to understand it from someone else who was much smarter than me, who explained it to me by listening to podcasts and stuff like that. And see uh, the value of podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> so I'm going to, I don't know if I'll be able to fairly characterize his work because it's so confusing, but what he basically says is that there is a logical structure to language. And language basically uh, allows us to understand meanings of the words and things like that. And the, uh, you will, uh, there are certain questions that you can ask in language it could make you it would give you meaning but it couldn't like tell you uh, how to answer those questions so there is a limitation to language so um like from like chomsky has these these sentences where you can grammatically arrange those sentences but those are meaningless right so uh, it's some it feels something similar for wittgenstein he says if you ask questions like what is meaning in life or what is love or what what does god mean you can ask those questions pose those questions logically but there is no answer to it. It's it would be asking like mathematically is one plus one equals four. I mean you can say no, but it it's it's something you hit a brick wall there where there is a problem with uh the language doesn't allow you to explain these things. So what do you think about that? So um, if I understand the question right, right? It's the yeah, difference between language and experience, right? Or uh, is there a limitation on languages yes. uh, relative to, say, experiences? And I would think that, you know, these are not the same thing, language and experience. Language is a medium. Okay. Um, one way to think about this is, I think, analog and digital signals, right? So um, our experiences are more nuanced and more subtle, uh, more individualized. And as soon as we put this into language, we're automatically reducing the signal to some subset of sounds that exist in our language, to subset of words that have particular meanings in our language. Hmm. Um, so I think the idea that there would be differences between language and experience makes sense to me. Right? These aren't the same thing. Now, admittedly, this is a phil philosophical question, philosophy yes. of language outside my area of expertise. You know, I think about this as, you know, I'm more trying to understand the mechanics of language. Hmm. So. Um, if a mechanic is an expert on fixing cars, uh, he might you know, struggle with the question of what is the value of cars in our life or something, right? So, yeah. I mean, this is a, this is outside uh, what I typically address in my research, but but there is a difference between the medium that we're communicating and then the, our experiences, right? So this is also related to a question in language, the sphere wharf hypothesis of whether the language, particular language yeah. or languages in which you speak change your cognition and change yeah. your function. Uh, earlier I mentioned some research where the pendulum swung back 
and forth over the years. Um, that is one that uh, is the case as well. So there was originally this hypothesis that the language or languages you speak would affect the nature of your perception, memory, mm. other cognitive capabilities. Well, that was an intriguing hypothesis. There was little to no support for that. Mm. But more recently, there is some evidence to suggest that that's the case. Oh. So imagine that you have uh, words in your language to describe different shades of blue that I don't. Would that actually change our perception of different shades of blue or our, or our memory for what we had seen? Hmm. Uh, again, I think the weight of the evidence in the years had, had been that there was little support for that idea, but more recently this, there is some support. Has there been any research done on whether people that are, uh, speak different languages, if that, you know, the language that they think in affects the way that they deal with difficult situations or even psychopathology like let's say we have two people who are clinically depressed but because the one person uses a particular language um, versus the, the other one are they any is there any adv advantage to that and the way you think about the world and how that affects you know your perception and in, in a like a clinical context right so the particular language or languages that you speak there may be again there's more recently some discussion around this idea uh, there's actually an interesting TED talk about this concept of say whether you're more or less able to save money save for the future based on whether or not your language has terminology that is consistent with doing so wow. um, so there there are these ideas research I'm more familiar with and more directly tied to my own research is back to bilinguals so um, if you have a bilingual and they're not a balanced bilingual. So they clearly have a first or dominant language in which they're much more proficient, but they're at least conversational in, in another language, a weaker language, but conversational. And if they've had traumatic experiences and they're difficult to talk to because of this you know, strong emotional attachment to the situation or situations, then they may be more efficient in a clinical context in their weaker language in their non-dominant language because there's less of a, an emotional tie to that language. So in my lab, we haven't done the clinical work to support that direct claim, but we've done other research to show that um, that listeners or, or participants are more sensitive to emotional words in their first language than in their second language. So in some of our work, we have uh, exposed participants to neutral words and to taboo words. So you can imagine swear words and other types of taboo words that you might be exposed to, that if you're exposed to these words in your first language, there's a greater difference between your responses to neutral and taboo words than if you're exposed to these in your second language. Even if you know, you're well aware of what these taboo words mean, you know that they're taboo words, but you're not as, um, you don't have the emotional connotation to these words as, as strongly in your second language, so they come closer to appearing just like a neutral word. Which anecdotally, if, if you're uh, bilingual or multilingual, you might know it's easier to swear in your non-native language, right? Yeah. If you try to ask participants to swear in their native language, they might be reluctant to do it. They might have a longer reaction time before they start to do it. They might be quieter in their response. Um, but if it's a non-native language, they just have no problem um, doing that. Yeah. Is, has that been your personal experience as well? <laughs> it has a little bit, yeah, of course. Yeah. How about you, Madwa? Yeah, I mean... Of the four languages you know, which <laughs> is the most comfortable English. to swear in? <laughs> English? Yeah, yeah because um, that's the language that I learned, um, the uh, I would say, the last. So, I mean, I can swear very fast in English, but if I... Because Partly, I didn't know what it me what it means, like the implications of those swear words are. But if in my native language, I exactly know what the swear word means right. and how insulting that would be for that person if I say it to them. Right. So, <laughs> but I think that's the case, even if you know, right? There, yeah. are, there are some swear words, and I'm sure you're well aware of what they mean and their connotations. That would still probably be easier for you to say in English than they would in your yeah. native language. That is true. So, well, uh, that's. Well, yeah, I mean, we've got one more question. Um, what advice do you have for, you know, people who are undergrads, they're thinking about psychology, that they think it might be something they want to get into? Any advice? 
So the advice that I think all of us in our department are trying to, to convey to undergraduate students is the value of research and the importance of getting some research experience. So that's true whether your next goal is graduate school in psychology or if you uh, intend to graduate and go uh, find a job right after a bachelor's degree, that's important to get exposure to research. So that's one thing. Another piece of advice I would have is to consider at least getting a minor and, and possibly a double major in psychology and something else. So psychology is a pretty broad, pretty diverse field. So one way to help either employers or graduate programs understand the nature of your experience in psychology is to try to, to get a double major. So someone applying to our graduate program to work in my lab, for example, if they had double majored with linguistics and psychology, that might be a good combination or a, a speech communication and um, science in, in psychology. In other areas, you might consider you know, psychology and biology. Um, then you can go into a neuroscience lab and so on. So considering how to either get a minor or a double major with psychology, I think, can add value, help you stand out to fellow applicants for either jobs or graduate programs. I think, too, um, my experience has been as an undergrad working as a research assistant in a lab that I, I've also just gained a lot of transferable skills there, too. Um, I mean, even if I didn't have grad school applic uh, aspirations, I, I think I still, there's a lot that would to be taken out of that, I think, that could be applied anywhere. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is my first, first year at CSU, and um, and I'd never worked in a lab, although um, I had undergraduate um, degree and stuff like that, and did some research. But working in a lab is a completely different experience, dealing with the participants, dealing with the data, dealing with other lab members and all of that. It, it has a completely different um, dimension to it, this completely different experience to it as compared to you going out and doing research on your own, which is what I used to do, just talk with the professor, go out and do the research. The lab is much more of a place where you work with different projects and things like that, which is uh, you get to learn new things that you probably would not through your own research. So. Yep, that's true. And, and I think part of that is understanding the value of some of the skills that you get being part of a lab, even if it's not exactly the area that you thought you right. would have done if you were doing this on your own, right? I think often, too, students, undergraduate students think, this is exactly what I do want to do, and I'm not interested if I can't get this exact experience. But I think just getting understanding the value of the training that you would get in being part of a lab, part of a team, uh, will help better prepare you even if it's a couple of years out before you get to do exactly yeah. the type of research that you're interested in yes uh, well i think we are out of all the questions yeah i guess we'll just wrap it up there thanks so much for joining us sure thank you good thank luck you. with the uh, podcast series yeah. thanks 